Okay. Um, I remember to record. And I'll, I'll share the recording as soon as we finish and it ends up in my um, email oh. or whatever. I was actually wondering, like, you you should not record it because I if I would record it directly on my computer, um, it's gonna um, it's it's a separate app and it's uh, and I can freely just record it. I think it might take like your storage place and it would be a hassle. Oh no, it's it's not it's not an issue um, because okay. I I um I record it like there are two options when you um when you record there's um there's record to your desktop which would like take a lot of space um but you can also record it to the cloud that's why I, I send you like that link like it's not it's not actually on my computer it's like in the cloud oh that's that, that, okay that's okay yeah, yeah. It's, it's so helpful like like recording like i i gave a talk that was like an hour long and it would have been like i don't know 30 gigabytes which like my computer doesn't even have <laughs> yeah that actually helped me like last uh, Last week when I was reviewing my stuff for exams, I put it up and tried to review some concepts using it. Thank you so much. Yeah, totally. Um, I say we start with this one because it's harder. We should always start with the harder ones and then we have less energy for the other ones. Um, so this one is more or less entirely, the whole big concept for this one is heat. So like heat is, I guess Wikipedia, the definition might give it a little bit differently, but when, when we talk about it in physics, um, heat is really energy. Um, let's see what Wikipedia tells us. Okay, it does, it gives it correctly. Um, so heat is like an energy. Um, it's a type of you know, kinetic energy, potential energy, and then heat energy. So like whenever you see the word heat, you should always think of like heat energy as, as a, like the, long, the longer version of the word heat. Um, and so what's happening here in our problem, we have a system in equilibrium. So if you like, if you block out the steam for a second and you think about how the, the system starts, it is this vessel or like this, this chamber here and then the water is sitting inside of it. And this sentence right here, both the vessel and the water are initially at the same temperature. That's what we're looking for at the end as well. So that's kind of a, um, a term that, that says that a system will reach an equal equilibrium at a certain point. And it's called thermodynamic equilibrium. Um, if you have, um, you know, if you if you put a an ice cube on uh, your desk, eventually uh, the ice cube will melt, and then it will heat up to whatever temperature your room is. Um, so, in both of those processes, two things happen, um, and that's what we'll deal with in this um, uh, problem as well. One, uh, the ice melts. So when, when it melted, it went from a solid, which is very different from a liquid. Like the, the liquid has more, the, the molecules are free to move around. Um, it doesn't have like a, like a, the molecules of ice would look kind of like, kind of like a lattice, like a, almost like a matrix, like they would be like rows and columns and, and stuff like that. Um, whereas a liquid, everything's moving around and, and colliding and stuff like that. So that's called a, a phase change. So when something goes from solid to liquid or liquid to gas or in the, in the opposite direction, that is what we'll use something called latent heat. Latent heat is, the, the definition is probably just what I said, when, when something changes a phase. So this doesn't actually have to do with yeah it's just uh here yeah this is what i was just about to say it doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that the ice cube on your desk is changing to the temperature of the room it's only the heat required to change from uh the ice to the liquid um this is kind of like <clears throat> um above a certain energy maybe like if, if you took um uh, chemistry or something like only above a certain energy do the molecules start to spin. 
So, you know, like um, the ice is, is solid, solid, solid. And then above a certain energy level, it, you know, spreads around and becomes uh, a liquid. Um, in the gas phase, um, things are still moving around. Like it's just more rapidly, there's more energy. So there's more kinetic energy. The gases molecules are moving around more, but as you give more energy, um, and what you deal with in chemistry a lot is like different degrees of freedom. So something can either be um, moving, which is like translational degrees of freedom. Uh, maybe it's a diatomic molecule. So um, the thing is rotating. That's another degree of freedom. Or it could be like vibrating. So that's like another degree of freedom. And all those things kind of happen at certain energy levels. That's like the, the quantum nature of, of physics and chemistry. Um, a similar thing is, is happening with this latent heat. When it goes from a solid phase to a liquid, it, it requires a ton of energy to jump that gap. Um, so in this problem, instead of an ice cube on a desk, we have water that is eventually going to turn into steam. So there are two um, types of latent heat. There is fusion. So fusion is like when things come together um, so fusion is like gas to water to solid. So it's, it's like going down in, in the ladder. It's becoming more condensed and, and like a rows, rows and columns. Whereas vaporization talks about both of those things. So vaporization is solid to liquid as well as liquid to gas. Um, and then vaporization, just think of spreading out, fusion coming together. Um, and they, they actually are different for each of the things. It's, it's much easier for uh, things to stick together than it is to break them apart. So that's why vaporization, the one where like uh, solid goes to liquid, goes to gas, is, is much, much higher. You can see it's almost an order of magnitude. Well, it is it's definitely an order of magnitude. Um, so the, the general scheme of our problem is forget about the steam for a second. We have water in this thing, this uh, pressure vessel, as they call it, like a, a metal box. And they're both at the same temperature. So they're, they're in equilibrium because things eventually, the, that ice cube that we dropped on the desk, it's never going to, unless we like put a, a lighter next to it, it's not going to get hotter than the room. Um, it's, they're both going to come to the same temperature. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Um, when we studied this concept in chemistry, the fusion meant melting of a substance like fusion of ice. Hmm. So the latent heat of fusion of ice was like there was a value we used for um, in these kind of problems. That's weird. Usually it's, um, let's see. I just want to make sure it's different in chemistry or physics or like, yeah, it says here, let in, lead in heat of fusion melting. You're right. What's going on here? It's actually different than the fusion in the nuclear fusion. Mm. I see. So what's happening here? Melting is going from solid to liquid and vapor oh okay so i i thank you for pointing that out because i made a very um crappy um mistake the difference is the two levels so it's it i, I was thinking it's it the the direction is what was what was differentiating these two but that's not the case as you pointed out fusion is melting vaporization is um vaporizing. So in either direction. So if something goes from gas to liquid, it's always vaporization. And likewise, if something goes from solid to liquid or liquid to solid, it's always fusion. Okay, thank you. That is very, let's see, did I do the problem wrong? <laughs> um, hold on. Um, which one did I use? I used Okay, I used vaporization, so I, I got it right by guessing. Uh, <laughs> it was the wrong, I, I got it right for the wrong reasons. Um, let's see here. Okay. Um, 
Yes, good point. Okay, so this is always solid liquid. This is always liquid gas. Okay. Um, got it. Um, and the next thing is, so that, that was the initial system, forgetting about the steam. And then we put in some really hot steam. So this steam is like 100 degrees Celsius more than the system before. All of them have masses. And then what we do is we say, what is the final temperature of all of this? If it started at that without the steam, add the steam, what happens? Um, so here's where you start to get equations for, for those terms I was talking about before. Um, this is just a, a, the most general equation. Um, it's not actually useful for this, um, this problem. I just, it was the first thing that came to my mind. Um, and it, it reads, this is, I think it's called the first law of thermodynamics. It says that an increase in energy of a system is either due to heat being added to the system or work being done on the system. So for instance, if I, um, um, what's the word? If I, if I, where is it? Where's the picture? If I made this volume smaller and I like increased, um, you know, I, that's, that's another word for doing work on the system um, because you can see that the, the equation for doing work on a system is either, uh, it, it's more or less always changing the volume, um, doing work on a system. It's like either letting it expand or, or, or pushing it in and things like that. But um, it turns out that was um, just you know, my brain working like that. This is the real, um, the first equation that we're gonna be using. This is um, what happens when the ice cube has already melted and it's increasing to the temperature of our room. So this is the change, the heat energy added when the temperature of something changes, rises, changes, uh, or, or decreases. And what it is written as, the mass of whatever is, you know, the, um, for, you know, in our case, the water would be one of them. We would, we would calculate uh, the mass of the water and then the specific heat of the water. How, how resistant is it to changing? That's, that's really what the specific heat is. It measures um, how much energy do we need to put into something in order to raise it one, uh, one Kelvin, one, one degree. Uh, we'll get to Kelvin in a second. And the, the, sometimes you might see a capital C. Um, a capital C is, is, it doesn't care about the mass, but you can see in the units here, this one cares about the mass. So a, a, a lowercase c is more helpful at, at this level um, because you're talking about a specific mass versus the big C, which would just be the material in general. And then DT, um, you could also, I, I, I write these Ds um, just to represent, it's, it's a change in something. Um, you can either, you know, some, some people write triangles like a delta, delta Q and delta T, or you can even just write Q and T. Um, I just, I, I always learned to keep the D, to, to understand that it's a, a change in temperature. And um, like our ice cube melting on the desk with the latent heat, the same thing will happen for our water. So in this case, because it's, as you pointed out, uh, liquid to gas, we'll be using vaporization. And that's why they give us this L. This L is how much energy is needed for a, a given number of, of, for a given mass, how much energy is needed. So if we multiply that by the mass, we know how much heat is needed in order to like flip that switch and go from, in this case, liquid to, to gas. So these are the two heating equations that we're gonna use in this problem. And we have to figure out, um, so this is the, the phase change going from liquids to, gas, and we need to figure out uh, which elements of the system, and this is the hard part of the, the, uh, the problem, what elements of the system use these heats? So the first one 
steam is going in at this temperature. And the key, the key sentence here is that the system will reach equilibrium with all the water being vaporized. So that means at the end of the day, there's not gonna be any water in this whole box. It's all gonna be steam, just steam at another temperature. So the steam stays at its, at, at, um, in the same phase. So there's no steam going to, to liquid here. The steam is just dropping in temperature. So for the, for the steam, that part of the system, we're just gonna be using the change in temperature equation. Similarly, for the pressure vessel on the outside, the pressure vessel is, is, is something like, is, it's kind of like a container for the system. So the pressure vessel is definitely not gonna be turning into vapor. Um, it's just going to be containing the whole system. But, um, and this is, this is uh, a, kind of a, a, a whole nother level to the problem because usually um, you assume that your, your container is, is what's called like a, a perfect container um, where you don't really care about it. You just assume like the, the easier problem is just to consider this, this uh, problem you, where you don't even look at the, at the thing containing it. That's, and that's the usual, like, you know, on an exam or something, that's what I, what I saw. But this problem is actually asking us to consider everything. And the reason I, I knew that was because one, it gives us the, the specific heat, the little uh, lowercase c, and it gives us the mass. So that tells me that this pressure vessel is changing temperature as well. Um, so we have to consider the, the process happening inside this container and it changing, actually changing the, the temperature of the metal kind of box that we're, that we're working in. And so that means we're going to use this equation on the pressure vessel. Now for the water. The water is going from water to steam. So that means we use this first. And then the steam is heating up. So if you were to make this water turn into steam, it's still only at 52 degrees Celsius versus 100 degrees Celsius. 150 degrees Celsius. So the water is definitely going to be warming up. As you can see in the set, uh, other sentence again, it, the water is going to be vapor, vaporized and have some final temperature above 100 degrees Celsius. So we have this for water and this for water. So writing all this out, I have that the heat going into the system on one hand is from the steam. So the steam goes into the system and contributes some, some heat energy. And that causes the water to warm up. Uh, well, it first causes the water to vaporize. Then it causes the water to warm up. And because of this process, the vessel warms up. So I have one thing going in and three results happening. And if I write this in the, in the um, kind of language over here, I have the change in, or the, the heat energy supplied from the steam, the heat energy um, given to the water, uh, for the heat energy needed in order to vaporize something, and the heat energy given to the vessel. If I write things out in those equations, uh, dq is mc dt. So here, this is steam. So I have the mass of the steam, which I'm given here. I have the specific heat of steam, which surprisingly is not the same as water. If something is steam, it, it's actually, um, it needs less energy to raise, raise up a degree per kilogram. And then I have the change in temperature, which I'm just gonna leave as the change in temperature for a moment. Then I have the water. So I have the mass of the water, which likewise is given, the specific heat of the water, which again, in that chart I was given, and then I just have DT. Then the vaporization, that was a latent heat one. So that is ML. So I have the mass of the water, 
and then the latent heat of vaporization because it's going from a uh, liquid to a gas. And then finally for the vessel, I have the mass of the vessel, the specific heat of the vessel, which they give me a, with, you know, way too much information. It's just this one because they tell me that it's a, a cad, cad, cadmium, cadmium uh, vessel. And then I have DT. So what I'm doing first with this um, uh, DT business, if I look at the last sentence that the system will reach equilibrium, that means that the final temperature of all three of these things is gonna be the same. So as opposed to in the beginning of the problem when it was just the water and the pressure vessel, we're at the same temperature of 52. Now all three of them are gonna be the same temperature. So when I write this uh, T final, which is uh, what they ask you for at the end, I'm, I'm talking about the final of all three of these things. So when I write DT, uh, DT is like a, a difference in temperature. It's a, the, the change in temperature that's, that's leading to this heat energy. I have the original temperature of the steam because this is like, it's, it's greater. Um, you know, there was, there's nothing stopping me from, from reversing this order. Um, you would just need to keep track of the minus, minus signs in a different way. Um, but what I did was I kept everything um, like, so every, all the differences are positive. So that, that's what I, I did. I chose, since I knew that the steam is the, the hottest thing starting, I put the steam on the left and I put whatever the final temperature is on the right. So this is my left-hand side. And then over here, I have for all, all the things on the left-hand side, it's TF, like the, the final temperature, because I know that the water and the vessel are both heating up. So I put the TF on the left-hand side for this one. And now what I'm doing- um, uh, Explain that again, that why you put different values for delta T on left and right side. So that's because the steam and the water vessel system are, are, are starting like their initial temperature is different. So if you go over here, it said both the vessel and the water are initially, so like before anything happens, they're initially at 52.7 degrees. But then you add steam to the system, which is at a much higher temperature. So the change in temperature of the steam is not the same as the change in temperature of the, um, um, the, the water and the vessel. Okay, they're not the same, but um, how do you know, like, um, how do you know you have uh, to, because delta T should not, should be, T final minus T initial, right? Right. Yeah, but how do you know, like you have to do it T initial minus T final? Oh, you're, you're saying this part right here? Yeah. Um, it, it doesn't. So I'll, I'll, I'll keep that in mind and just, and just do it um, like you mentioned, T final minus T initial. Um, and then I'll, we'll, we'll see, let's see what would change. Um, so what, what I'm doing in this step here is I'm bringing all the TFs to the left-hand side. Because then if I plug all these numbers in, I have something that says uh, this number times the variable that I want times or equals some number. So these are all things that I know. So I wanna get this TF on, on the left-hand side. So let me do that, but with this reversed. So I would have TF here. So that means this would be positive. Um, let's see, tools. You know, to hit um, whatever. Um, okay. That would be positive over here. Um, TF over here, and then the steam would be over here. So this would be T initial. And then that would be what I'm 
doing for that one would be adding it to this side. So that would mean this one is positive. Okay. Let's see how this works out. So now what I what I did was I just I distributed all these. So these are all in parentheses. So I multiplied this by that, and then I multiplied this by that. You know, I, I distributed things outside the parentheses, and I did the same over here. M water seawater times TF, M water seawater times minus T water. And then I, I kept everything that I know the values of over here. And then I kept the TFs over here. So then I went all the way over to Excel because now it's you know a ton of variables that I have to I have to put in. So the initial temperature of the water and the vessel is 52 degrees, 52.7 degrees Celsius. However, um, when we when we work with um, temperature changes and stuff like that, we always work with Kelvin. Um, <clears throat> however, now that I think about it, um, this is just really a rule of thumb that you change it to Kelvin and and go back. But uh, the answer is actually they ask for it in Celsius. Um, and because you're talking about um, it's not it's not Fahrenheit. The the only difference between Kelvin and Celsius is you add. A specific number, um, so it actually like this step actually wasn't really necessary for me to oops um, to to do that because I'm talking about changes in temperature. So if, if if I just all I'm doing for every single t is I'm adding a number, it it doesn't really matter. Um, but that's just a convention. Um, so I'm just uh, plugging in everything I have. I have the mass of the vessel for Cad, cadmium is um, 0 .40, 0 .4, 0 0.01 kilograms. The water is 0.459 kilograms. And the steam is very heavy, lots of steam, at 17.3 kilograms. And then I go to the bottom and I look for the specific heat of all the things. The cadmium is uh, 231 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. The water, because it is water, not steam at this point, is 4186 joules per kilogram per Kelvin. And likewise for steam, I just read it off here. And then the vapor going from uh, liquid to gas is 223, or I guess it's 2,230,000. And now I'm just oh, and I'm and I'm looking at temperatures. Where here, it's in Kelvin for some reason. Now that I realize it wasn't really necessary, um, that's I'm just getting these from from there. Where I'm adding 273.15 for some reason. So let's see how here. So now I'm I'm starting to evaluate all these terms over here. Mass of the steam times uh, the specific heat of steam is that number. I'm going to do the same thing here. M water, C water is just the product. And the same thing for the vessel. Mass of the vessel times the specific heat of the vessel. So one thing I'll do to change, oh, right. We had a plus over here. So one thing I did here was I just added them all together and I had the, the minus sign. So let's do it differently to see, or maybe let me do this. Copy it to see, because I'm pretty sure the result is going to be the same. It was just a conventional thing. Okay. Um, let's see, so it's steam first, so that one's positive. And then H6, that one's the water, so that one's negative. And then the vessel is I6, and that one's negative. Okay, 
Now on this side, we have um, order, uh, water. So water, water, water. This is the heating up of the water. It's just the product of all three of those things. Mass, specific heat, temperature. The latent heat here of the, the water changing to the gas is the mass of the water times the L, L of vaporization. And then we have the vessel heating up. Vessel, specific heat, temperature. And then this new plus sign for the steam, which was, which was from adding this minus to this side. So let's change this right-hand side to, let's see, so it's minus water plus vapor minus vessel and plus steam. Okay, so now I have the left-hand side, which is, hmm, maybe I made a math mistake because now, now that I'm, I'm looking at the bottom here, that's not the same number that I got from this side. So you may be right, let's see. Anyway, well, um, let's see, going down to the bottom. Now I have this number on this side, and this number on that side. So to get TF, I just divide uh, the bigger one by the smaller one on the left-hand side, and I get that number in Kelvin. And then I do the same thing, but in reverse, I, I take away that conversion factor. Um, so let me think. Let me think a little bit about why those two are different, because you can see, you know, it's pretty different. It's um, 117 Celsius versus 187 Celsius. Um, so let's see um, which one is right. And I can already see it now that I'm, I, I said it out loud. Um, if you head back to the problem, the steam was at an initial temperature of 150. There's no way that the system is going to be at a higher temperature because this was at a lower temperature and the addition of, of those two things um, is definitely not going to be greater than this. So if you add something, you know, this is, um, what is that? I mean, they're both pretty hot, but it's, it's not, there's no way that you can add something that is this temperature and something that is this temperature to get something that's greater than either of those. It's, going, it's always going to be something in the middle of those two numbers. And so let's try to understand this a little bit more based on my, um, like what was my thinking when I did this? It was, mm -hmm. I'm thinking it may have to do with absolute value. Um, the fact that it really doesn't matter in what direction it's changing, like final versus initial. Um, let's see here. Let's see. I'm sure. Because if it's an absolute value, that'll it like that's just um, an easy answer.
I'm going to guess this section. This is what we're going to use for the, the second problem. When I try to solve it, I got like 156.66 degrees centigrade and it didn't work. I'm pretty confident in my 117. I'm just trying to explain the, the change in temperature. Let's see if I can find this in a better location. Um, where is that cat? Um, heat. Mm -hmm. okay. mm, let's try. Yes. Here we go. DT, DT. I think the best explanation is the absolute value. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I think it's just an absolute value. I don't. I don't think the direction of the of the heat, you know, whether it's getting hotter or colder, I don't think that matters because it's not like it's not like we're going, um, you know, whether we're going up or down. It still has the same heat capacity. It's still the same mass. Um, the only thing that would matter is like the um, whether it's going from like you like you pointed out, whether it's going from solid to liquid or liquid to solid, that that matters. Um, but I don't think either heating or cooling matters for this um, delta T because delta T is just a difference um, in the two of them. Let's see if they have maybe like a example problem down here. So this is uh, water raising raising in temperature by one. So it, it doesn't have a, a sign or anything like that. Um, this is again uh, water temperature rising. Mm -hmm. Um. Just like in this uh, solution here, E 
delta E equals MC delta T, they made one side negative and the other side stays positive. So delta E, so the, the sample, which would be, oh, I see what you're saying. Okay, um, very good point. So the energy of the steam is being lost. So you're saying we should have a minus yeah. here which would correct everything. So, so what you're saying is this is all heat gained. So gained, gained, gained. This is lost, so it should be a minus. And then we should have the correct, what, what you said, um, final minus initial, but with a minus yeah. in front. So- Yeah, and then your explanation would be correct. Right, okay, good catch. So let me, um, let's see, annotate, make it a rectangle. Um, this is so annoying. I'm like, why can't I make changes to it? Um, so I guess just X that one out. Um, let's X that one out too. Bring this over here. What's going on? Okay, so that is what we had originally. Oops, what just happened? Okay, and then a minus sign. Okay, so then if we distribute everything, we have a minus TF, which we have here, um, and then a, a plus T steam, but then when we bring it over to the right hand side, it would be minus T steam. And then this works based on these. Oh no, not that. This one. Good catch, good catch. Yeah, it was the correct answer, it worked. Okay, cool. Let's get away, see if it saves. No. Yes, got it. Okay. Also a good call doing the hard one first since I actually made a mistake. Classic. I think I've made at least one mistake every every time you catch something. Um, let's see. Okay, so this next one is much easier. It deals with just one equation, um, which is called the ideal gas law. Um, it is a law that relates um, 
the pressure. So how, how much pressure is being exerted on the gas, how much area or, or volume the gas is allowed to occupy, um, how much of the gas is there. So like how many little, um, like how many particles or, or how, many, how many molecules are moving around in the gas um, with how hot the gas is. Um, and it's related by two equations. Uh, well, one equation, but two different kind of constants. You can either use this side, which for us in this equation, or this problem is, is easier because it asks about the number of moles. And little n is the number of moles. This one would be helpful if we were asked about the number of molecules or the number of particles. I, I like to call them particles because it helps me differentiate between molecules and moles. I always get those confused. Um, so I, I never call anything a molecule. Um, I always just call it the number of particles floating around. Um, and the, the difference here is that when we use moles, we have this constant called R, which is called the gas constant. And it's made up of uh, this one over here. So that's the K, a small K, it's, or you can abbreviate it as KB, it's called Boltzmann constant. Or you can just use, if you're you know, using this moles equation, the gas constant, which is the product of Boltzmann constant and another constant called Avogadro's number. It's really small over there. So I wrote that R, this gas constant, is equal to Na, Avogadro's constant, or Avogadro's number, I think it's called, uh, times Boltzmann constant. So that's what we're going to use for this one. Um, and for some reason, I, I insisted on uh, writing out this product, um, Na equals Kb, when in reality, it's, it's actually much, much easier to just remember what R is. If, you, if you're going to, use, like if you're going to use this equation, it's easier just to remember what R is um, because that is a simple, um, Avogadro's number has a, an exponent and Boltzmann constant has an exponent and it just so happens that they both have the same exponent. Um, so it's, it's really just a, a number. So we have pressure, each of them, volume, each of them, and temperature in each of them. And then uh, this is either the, the moles or the number of particles. And then these are like the constants that explain um, how all those variables are, are related. So there's really only four variables, the pressure, the volume, the number of the, like how much of the material there is, and the temperature. And then R or K, is like a, a relationship that's been tested experimentally um, over, you know, 150, 200 years ago um, that explained it. And, you know, they just kept doing experiments and eventually they, uh, you know, all got the same number. You know, everyone kept getting the same number. So in this problem, we're looking at, we're given that on a particular day at this temperature, the density of air is that we don't actually need this density just yet. Um, uh, the only thing we need is that we are at atmospheric pressure. So what that means is that if we look up, that's just a unit of pressure. It's called like an ATM usually. However, that isn't, um, like it's, it's just a unit, um, but it's not the standard unit. Like when we, when we use, um, where did that? when we use this PV equals NRT, this is like, you would use whatever that the SI unit is, the standard unit, standard unit, and then, you know, standard units across the board. Um, but one, one ATM or one standard um, atmospheric pressure is not a, an SI unit. But Pascals, Pascals are the, are the standard unit. So this is the SI unit for pressure. And so we know that if it's at one atmosphere, one unit of atmospheric pressure, we have 101,000 Pascals. So that's what that, the wording there gives us. It gives us the pressure, Where is it? Uh, right here, it's the pressure and 
Likewise, it gives us the volume, one meter squared. So that's like a, a box, that's a, a meter uh, or a cube with a side length of one meter. And we have the temperature, which is, um, and in, in this case, we do actually need to convert it to, to Kelvin. Um, so this is uh, in Celsius. So if I convert that to Kelvin, I just add this conversion factor. I add 273.15 and I get the, I get the temperature in Kelvin. And the reason for that is the, the units of Boltzmann constant or, or the gas constant. So if I go to um, the gas constant, its units are the amount of energy that's needed to raise one mole a degree Kelvin. So it's, it's everything's based in Kelvin for these, these variables. Similarly for, where is it, Boltzmann's constant? Boltzmann's constant is, the, is just without the, the mass, or I mean without the moles. It's the, the number, it's the amount of energy you need to raise something by one Kelvin. So it's all, all in Kelvin. So now that we're not doing the differences like we were before, we actually need to care about Kelvin. So now it's, it's asking me how many moles are contained in something at the given temperature and density, which is atmospheric pressure and 37 degrees Celsius. So I changed the Kelvin and then I just solved the equation for N. I rearranged this PV equals NRT for N I plug all those numbers in and I realize that I don't even need to be plugging those in because I can just look up this, you know, I looked those up on Google and, you know, there's no reason to have to know those off the top of your head. I mean, I guess on the test, maybe you'd be given them or something like that. Um, and then I just solve for N and it turns out to be around 39 moles. I'm just, um, you know, putting the multiplication on the, on the numerator and the division on the denominator. And then I have how many moles there are. And then the next part is it's asking me what is the mass of air in that volume that I just calculated. This one is really the, the, the whole question kind of boils down to what Avogadro's number is. So Avogadro's number is the amount of molecules in one mole of material. Number of particles in one mole. So if it tells me that Avogadro's number of molecules has one, so Avogadro's number of molecules, another way to say that is one mole. So if one mole has that much mass, all I need to do is multiply the number of moles that I found for the first one times the mass of, the first, of just one of them. So that's what I do here. If Na is just one mole. We had that many moles for the first one. And then I'm just multiplying the two. Mass of one mole and the mass of all of them is just the product of 39.29 times the mass of one. And I end up with 1.1 kilograms. So if I head over to the next one, I'm asked, does this agree with what they had in the beginning? So now it goes back to this per, uh, this per uh, cubic meter. And it asked me to it gives me um, you know, a definition of does it agree with. So it tells me it agrees with it if they're within 10% of each other. So the only thing I need to do is to check that with a ratio or, or a percentage. So I just take the ratio of my, the answer that I got based on this, the calculations and the answer that, and the you know, theoretical answer that they gave me and I find that one of them is 95% of the other one. So that is definitely above 90%. So that means it's um, within 10% of the accepted answer. Um, so, so the answer would be yes, it is, because it's 95% accurate.
And the reason it's not 100% accurate is this sentence here. Assume air is an ideal gas. It is not in general. Air is not an ideal gas. Um, it's made up of a variety of, mole of molecules. Like there's, there's nitrogen, there's oxygen, all sorts of other pollution type stuff. Um, so it's not, it's not an ideal gas. Um, but we can assume, uh, assume some things about it, you know, making, making some assumptions. And it turns out that we can get pretty, pretty accurate results. And that's, that's the objective of this question is to show us that if we assume that air is an ideal gas, we're pretty accurate. We're 95% we're accurate. So yeah, that one, that one was much easier than the first one. Um, the really, the only, um, the only thing you, you, you need to, um, you know, extra thing you need to learn here is, is the, the ideal gas law, which is right here. Um, yeah. you know, where this one was like, you know, we had to clearly had to make some, uh, you know, hard math uh, mistakes here. Yeah. Can you show me the last page, please? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Got it. This one was easy, but I didn't know about, uh, I was getting confused with the molds and the number of particles thing. Yes, yeah, that's that's a very annoying, um, uh, I don't know, I don't know who named it moles, um, but it's, <laughs> it yeah, it's annoying. <laughs> so yeah, I just, I never, I never used the word molecules, <laughs> unless it's in the problem that I just remember myself, okay, it's particles, think about particles. Yeah, every time I have to like get to this most topic, I have to relearn everything. It's yeah, it's so annoying. Okay, these questions are solved. Just give me one second. Okay. Okay, so I checked, like, uh, I think I got a hold of other questions. For the okay, cool. Thank you so much. It was really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, and next week is my exam. It's like the final exam. So we might, like, um, if we can have a review session on, fr uh, on Wednesday. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we can have one, two, however many you need. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Email me, um, whatever, you know, we can uh, yeah. plan on Wednesday or we can do, you know, uh, Tuesday and Thursday, you know, it's up to you. Perfect. So I'll email you and have a great rest of the week. Okay. See ya. Bye.